All right, we'll look on page 27, on document 27. Any person has three modes from which to act and speak. This is pretty much what we talked about yesterday. These are sometimes called parent, adult, and child. <laughs> Speaking can be directed to those corresponding modes in the hearer. So one can speak parent to child, child to parent, adult to adult, and also can speak across lines also. Words determine some of the perspective, but tone of voice and body language are very important. Hopefully most conversation is adult to adult. So you could have the same words spoken that might, that in one tone of voice might be adult to adult, and another tone of voice might be child to child, okay? Or with another body language or another posture. So the parent, the positive features, zeal, instruction, directions, warnings, we all need that in our lives. We need to be able to give directions Warnings, we need to tell a child to get off the road. That's parent to child. You might even say that to an adult. Watch the car. Okay, if somebody's about to step in front of a car, you might speak parent to child like, just like that. Uh, it just sort of comes out of us. The negative features of parent would be control, giving orders, fear, insecurity, dominance, blame, accused, manipulation, demanding, inflexibility, not able to take a joke, uh, as, as we heard already, somebody speaks adult to adult, the person comes back child to adult or child to child, and this person was not happy, okay? So maybe this person is moving to parent when they got the child response. And so fixation, unyielding, non-negotiable, rigid, impassable boundaries. And so we have within us this ability to speak and act as a parent. Has some positive features, has some negative features. Uh, as an adult, the adult is all positive. Positive features like clear thinking, logical understanding, responsible, thoughtful, caring, healthy, loving, respect, joy, reality, truth, goals, compliments, value, convictions, dignity, good nature, accepts, correct, and compliments, uh, clear defined, clearly defined boundaries. That's the adult in us. We all have that capacity. Each of us has that capacity. For the child, the playful, Carefree, de-stress, fun, not holding a grudge. We can all interact that way, and it's very healthy to do that sometimes as a carefree and a playful way to live. Uh, negative features can be self-indulgent, not responsible, not sensitive, pouty, guilty, uh, wanting to be cared for, need, needy, needing compliments, accepting blame when not guilty, immature, lack of development, acting helpless, appeasement, undefined boundaries, so be careful with your life as you relate to your parents, as you relate to people your, who are your peers, as you relate to anybody, anywhere. Don't, don't allow yourself to get in that child mode, okay? If you are, you know, people tend to continue speaking down to you and you'll tend to want to be really defensive, okay? So what we said yesterday and want to reinforce today is that when someone speaks to you, uh, Let's see how we remember from yesterday. Somebody speaks to you, parent to child, and you then should respond how? Adult to adult. Don't, don't stay in the child modes. Go adult to adult and respond to them that way. When you, and there are different ways to say this. When you do not allow yourself to respond as a child, what you're doing is you're saying, I'm not a child. You don't want to say those words, but the message you're sending is, I'm not a child, okay? By, and you send that message by speaking adult to adult. Okay. I think sometimes you use the illustration of some, you know, maybe your dog ran across the neighbor's yard and the neighbor's upset. Okay. And so the neighbor comes back and says, why do you always have your dog running across my yard? That neighbor's talking to you parent to child. So you have a couple of options. One is to talk back child to parent. Okay. Say, well, I'm so sorry, you know, and if my dog just doesn't behave and all that kind of stuff, and it's the tone of voice and it's sending a message that you're acting like a child. Or you can come back and say, you can go parent to child to the neighbor and say, well, if you take care of your things and, and I won't always have to be looking out for your problems, you know, and after a while there's no logic to this at all, and you're responding parent to child, this is not going to go anywhere. But if your dog runs across the neighbor's yard and the neighbor's upset about it, and talks to you this way, and you go back and say, well, I'm sorry, I will do something about this. I'll make sure the dog stays on his leash, and et cetera, et cetera. You've now talked as an adult to adult. 
If the neighbor's still angry and still talks back to you parent to child, you just go right up here again, okay? And so we want to always make sure we're doing that and not allowing ourselves to stay in that child position. The child and parent experience impact the adult experience. In other words, the way you have lived, the way people talk to you, the experiences you've had in your life as you've been parented as other people, and not just by your parents, but by your teachers, your siblings, everyone else, uh, those, those things that you've experienced as parent will impact who you are as an adult. The things you experience as child, the way you were treated as a child, the way maybe you've had childish communications, will impact the way you are as an adult. So sometimes this is thought of as contamination. Your adult can get contaminated by parent or contaminated by child. And so this is why we talk about it, so we can think seriously about making sure that you're behaving as an adult. And then you'll be treated as an adult. So when you don't respond as a child, what you're doing is you're saying, I'm not a child. The message you're sending is, I am not a child. You're also, you're also sending the message that I heard what you said. You're sending the message that I'm an adult, I'm going to behave and talk as an adult, and I'm going to treat you like an adult. Okay? I'll probably ask you this on a test. I want, I want you to think through this well enough because we get here so often. And you get homes where one of the parents takes the parent position, one of the parents takes the child position, and they live this way for 50 years or maybe more. Okay? And when you do that, you get real serious difficulties in the home. You get serious difficulties because uh, if mom has always taken the parent position and dad's always taken the child position, that's kind of what's going to run the home. Or maybe dad always takes the parent position and mom always takes the child position. Okay. And I had this uh, scary event some many years ago when I was teaching this and uh, talking to some parents later, so at a different school. And they said at the supper table, our son said, Mom, you just talk to Dad, adult to adult. Okay? <laughs> of course, they hadn't a clue what this boy was talking about. <laughs> so <laughs> they came to me for an explanation. <laughs> so maybe you can get this resolved before your parents come and talk to me, you know, or whoever wants to talk to me about it. It's fine. I will talk to them about it. It's just so important that as adults, we live as adults, okay? And we respect each other as adults. Sometimes we need to do the parent-to-child thing in terms of direction, in terms of warnings. Sometimes we do the parent-to-adult thing or the adult-to-adult. As I said yesterday, teaching is primarily adult-to-adult or parent-to-adult, which is the way I try to keep all teaching. Sometimes I go back to the child mode by telling a story or something of that sort, you know, just to lighten things up a little bit. Uh, sometimes things happen in class where we have to look at it from a child perspective. But most of the time, we want to make sure that in our lives, we're living adult to adult. Particularly in our homes. You're dating, you get married, what kind of a home do you want? You know, what kind of a home have you grown up in? And what kind of a home do you want to produce? You don't want to produce a home in which one of you is the parent and the other one the child. Do you understand what I'm saying? Can you imagine places where this may have happened? Okay. It's just really, really unfortunate because then we get a home that's very disrupted. Uh, one of them's a, maybe mom's a parent and dad's a child. Maybe dad's a parent and mom's a child. And what, what that does then is impacts the way the children growing up in the family think about themselves. And then they don't tend to think about themselves as able to relate adult to adult they tend to identify either as parent or child and repeat the process. So that's what we do not want to have happen. So the child and parent experiences impact the adult experience. So listen for modes and fluctuation between modes in yours and others' conversations. So uh, sometimes when people are talking, they're just having fun. I remember one of my students uh, from way back uh, who is now a school teacher very fast, so maybe he's getting some of you know what he dished out to me. Maybe he's come back to him now. I hope so, but you know, <laughs> all in fun because we had a lot of fun with this. We would talk, a young man. He and I would talk, and sometimes even in class in question and answer time, and we would bounce around between these positions just for fun. And sometimes nobody could figure out what we were doing, 
but you can do that. Is if it's a fun time, as long as you're not injuring somebody, you're not saying something harmful, you're not hurting somebody, uh, you're not putting somebody down, you're just uh, kind of bouncing around between the parent, the adult, and the child, uh, just as a fun time. Okay, you can do that. It's not it's not a problem. So listen for modes and fluctuations between modes in yours and others conversations. Most conversation we want to keep adult to adult. In marriage in particular, we want to make sure we do that or it sort of contaminates the children. And after a while they're not quite sure in what role to live. Teaching should be a combination of parent and adult. Parent and child can be places to hide. Okay, It's easy to hide as a parent. If I'm always the parent, I'm always giving orders and nobody can talk to me and I'm unapproachable, unassailable, I never make any mistakes, that can be a place to hide. That can be a place where nobody can touch me. And it could be the mom in the family, it could be the dad in the family, it could be the principal of the school, it could be somebody in your dorm, it could be your neighbor, it could be almost anybody. But you can hide in that parent role, okay? where you never really become an adult, you never allow somebody to approach you on the same level. Child is a place to hide also. We can all, everything's a joke, right? You know anybody like that? Everything's funny, nothing's serious. Uh, and it's okay, some of us have that kind of a personality. But it, we can hide here by never be getting serious. No matter what happens, it's always some kind of a joke. It's always funny, it's always uh, lighthearted, and there's a place for that. But we don't want to hide here so nobody can ever get close to us. It's a way of putting a barrier uh, around your person. Parents sometimes talk to their two-year-old children adult to adult, and their 20-year-old children parent to child. This is absolutely the reverse of healthy conversation. You know, when children are two years old, uh, you do talk to them adult to adult. When in our family, what we tried to do, we certainly made many mistakes, but one of the things we tried to do was, when it was time to go to bed, if you just tell the children, off to bed, that's a little too abrupt. That's sort of parent to child, and sometimes you have to. You have to say, okay children, off to bed. But if you talk to them adult to adult, even if they're two or three or six years old, and you say, when the big hand gets up to the 12, we're gonna go to bed, okay? Now I have made an adult to adult statement. All right, now they're watching the hand. Oh, and they're learning that that hand moves, right? <laughs> and after a while it does get up to the 12, and they start thinking, oh, and then you warn them, okay, five more minutes, see the big hand? When we do that, we're, we're teaching the child to be an adult. When we just run in the room and say, off to bed right now, and clean up your stuff, they didn't have a warning, they didn't have any time, and all of a sudden they start thinking of life as people giving them orders, okay? But there are some areas in life where we do have to do that, and when a child is two, there are times we talk to them adult to adult, but we wanna make sure that also there are times where we're giving them directions. Here are your blue socks, you're gonna wear your blue socks, okay? Here are your carrots and beans. You're going to eat your carrots and beans, right? You've got to eat them. Uh, so they learn that there are times when parents will tell them what to do and they're going to listen. Unfortunately, then, as children get older, and what, what the struggle is, many times the young people come to me and say, well, my parents are talking to me like I'm a child and I'm 20 years old or I'm 24 years old. And here the problem is that many times they have not developed that relationship with the child and maybe they were, they were a little bit too free back, back here when they were two. Not always, sometimes they've stayed parent to child all the way through. And now the child's 23 years old <clears throat> and they're still being talked to parent to child. Jesus talked adult to adult most of the time even when he was teaching. When Jesus was teaching, almost all of it was adult to adult. Exception or well, exceptions to that one, when he was confronting religious leaders, he was really pretty rough on them. And that was really, I think, parent to child. You know, like, when are you going to learn? You get the same thing when you get the Apostle Paul teaching to the people in uh, Corinth, and he says, I wanted to talk to you like you were mature, but you're not. I have to keep feeding you milk because you haven't grown up. So he's clearly... Uh, he's clearly exhorting these people in a, in a pretty, pretty strong voice. As we're talking about this, as I was preparing for class this morning, I was thinking about SMBI. 
thinking about this school and ten years ago I was asked to come and teach here <coughs> and I was I was quite blessed to be here and I realized that this school was uh, it took me maybe a couple of weeks and I, I finally realized this school is what I would call a safe place okay anybody recognize school as a safe place do we need safe places we really do and it's just something of a miracle that God could make a school a safe place. But as a safe place, it means that the staff, the faculty, the administration of the school needs to deal with you adult to adult. Okay? <clears throat> we need to treat you as adults because you are. And what I noticed, uh, I, I'm only here two terms a year, so it's not like I see everything that happens here. But what I do notice is that the staff people, the teachers I've been able to work with here at the school, have been safe people. The men have been safe people. And I would call them heart men. Men who teach from the heart. Not only from the heart, we also need to know things. It's not just enough to have a heart. We also need to have a mind, okay? But the mind, and now my, now my mind is going many places here, so I'll... I'll diverge from the discussion and go and try and try and uh, emphasize on the basis of what we've been studying here something else and that is that as uh, as God works in us to make us like he wants us to make us more like him uh, C.S. Lewis talks about men without chests it's a strange anybody read C.S. Lewis and men without chests okay well he says he says that a man has a brain and a man has a belly. Okay? This gets a little, it's not supposed to be childish, but it, it's going to sound a little bit that way initially, all right? But eventually it'll, it'll take an adult to adult turn, okay? And in between there, you have a chest. And in your chest is one of these, okay? Hopefully, right? And so it's easy, and now I'm not blaming this on Lewis anymore. I'm taking his concepts and making it my own the way I process it. It's easy for a man, I'm talking about men now, the men who, the people who teach here are men, right? Okay. It's easy for a man to act out of his brain or to act out of his belly. In other words, either to act out of his intellect or his lust. That's very easy. And what God's calling us to do is take that intellect and process it through our heart. And then... And then act, okay. And take the lusts of life and not allow them to control, but process even that through the heart. And it's the heart that changes the person. And when you do this, you speak to the heart of the other person. You take your intellect and you take your desires. Maybe better to call this desires instead of the bad word lust. Let's call this one desires, okay? Let's call this desires and this uh, <coughs> knowledge, okay? And this is clearly heart, okay? And what I discovered is that uniquely and almost without a question that the men who teach here are men who teach from the heart. But some of them are pretty smart too, okay? You study in Greek, you know, there's somebody who's Put a little time in this, but can you, can you teach Greek from the heart? You can. Can you teach family issues from the heart? You can, okay. You know, my tendency is to go brain, okay. So I have to, I have to always be guarding that so that it comes out this way, okay. My tendency. Some men's tendency tends to be more from the desires. I don't tend to have problems in that area, but I tend to have problems in, I want it done right, I want it done now, you know, don't ask any questions, you know, that's sort of the me, unless I process it through my heart, then it comes out differently, okay, and so, but it's important that we do that, and when you have men who live from their heart, you get families that are happy, you get churches that are peaceful, you get schools where people can learn because they feel loved, because they are loved. Okay. I was just thinking this morning about 
Jesus. Uh, he's a high priest that can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. So I was thinking, I was thinking about that last night as I went to sleep, and I went over just typing some things on my computer about it, and then I was thinking about it this morning again. So Jesus, the God-man who died for us, but he also can be and is touched by your feelings. Do you believe that? Jesus is a man of the heart. He's more than that. I mean, he's a genius, right? I mean, he's God. But he also comes to us with the heart. He acts in our lives through his heart. And it's just so important that we do that. And I really, I don't get much credit for it, you know, but this school is a place where I think the men who are here teach from the heart. When you do that, you reach the heart. And, you know, as being God's men, that's the call in our life. That's the call in our life. And so we have to be careful. The world doesn't recognize this, you know. We have to be so careful because you can live out of your belly or those desires. You can live out of your brain or all of that knowledge. Or you can process everything God's given you. And he says... It's important that man has a chest, <laughs> real man, and in that chest, there's a heart. Men without chests don't have this. They're doing this or they're doing this. And this is not, I'm not, I'm not staying right on Lewis's book here. Okay? I'm not staying right on his essay here. I'm, I'm making it my own material and sharing it with you this way. Okay? So you read his essay and then you'll understand what he's saying, but this is the way I'm processing it. Terrific concept, really important concept, a concept to take along home. A few years ago, during one of the uh, times of testimony here, we were gathered in the, in the chapel. I remember a young lady uh, who said she found out that this school was a hospital. I have never forgotten those words. This school is a hospital. I read your papers. Do some of us need hospitals? We do. We really do. We really do. The only people who can provide that are people who are willing to live in an adult way. The only people who can provide that are people who are willing to process everything in life through their heart. Two things will change you. Love and truth. And those things have to be together. Remember yesterday we talked about, what did we talk about yesterday? We talked about so many things. But one of them was mercy and truth, right? We saw it in Proverbs 3. We saw it in Psalm 100. We saw it in Psalm 101. We saw it in Proverbs 16. Mercy and truth, love and truth. That's what it takes to change people. That's what will change your life. You can't do it with all love. And you can't do it with all truth. But love and truth together changes people's lives. And that's the call on my life. That's why I'm here. I'm not here because I don't know how to do anything else. Okay? I'm here because I love you. As I told you before, I don't know if I like you or not. But, right, I'm being a child a little bit. Okay? <laughs> I don't know if I know you well enough to like you, but from the love of God in me flows the love of God to you. And that needs to be that way. Okay? So I'm here because I love you and because I want your life to be changed the way God wants it changed. That's what. And if you... I'm backing up a step here. When I went to college, I was going to be a counselor. And the longer I thought about it and the more courses I took, I thought, you know, I'm going to be in a little room somewhere with one person, you know, an hour at a time all day long. And I started thinking, I don't want to do that. Okay. <laughs> I started thinking, if I could teach groups of people, maybe I could convey truth to many people at one time without having to deal with individuals. Okay? It's not wrong to deal with individuals. We do that too. But the more people we can impact with God's truth, the more we can change lives, 
the more we can change families, the more we can change churches, the more we can change the world. Because hopefully you can take whatever you learn here. You can take some time to take classes, to be in a hospital, to be at a place where you're cared for, to be at a place where people deal with you at the level of the heart. And so that your life can be changed by the truth and the love that God wants together in your life. Well, the question is, as I understand it, someone who's always been treated as a child and been spoken to parent to child, and then they go out into society, how do they learn to relate as adults? That's very difficult because they, they tend to think of themselves as a child. They've been treated as a child. And so, as I said, a child's a place you can hide. It's a place that you can find an identity, and when you find your identity there, then probably you relate to everyone as a child. And I've seen adults who are 70 years old still doing this. Uh, it's, it's easy for them to do that. Many times what they're trying to do is shirk responsibility. I mean, as they get older, not initially, because they were treated as a child, so they act as a child. But after a while, they just realize that they can't handle any responsibility, and so they don't. So every time they get in a situation, they'll avoid promotions. They'll avoid... Uh, Maybe they've been chosen to be a deacon and they say, no, I can't do that. I mean, without even attempting, they'll say they can't, okay? Or maybe a promotion at work, or maybe even in dating, okay? They'll just, they'll just put themselves as the child in that relationship. And it could be the man. The young man dating may, may be always thinking about himself as a child, and so as he gets in a relationship with a young lady, he's still the child. And he treats her like his mom and she's supposed to take care of him, okay? What can they do? Well, it, it can be a real struggle because there's so many the problems created by it that it sort of becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And if they can get somebody can speak into their life and help them and say, well, really, you know, you have more skills than you think you do. You have more ability than you're giving yourself credit for. Uh, don't beat yourself up. I'm talking the way I would talk to this person, okay? Don't beat yourself up. I mean, just look what you have accomplished. Look what you can do. Uh, and sometimes I just come right out and say, you know, I really do love you. And those seem like strange words to come from an old man like me. But at the same time, many times they just have not felt the love. They haven't felt the care. And you just need to keep reinforcing them. And give them some, some responsibilities and see if, how they do with them, you know? and give them lots of feedback that's very complimentary, but never talk down to them. As soon as you talk down to them, you've, you've as we said before, cemented this, okay? So I want to constantly get that adult-to-adult -adult relationship there. Can be a real struggle. Many times you see those individuals who do not function so much as adults, they can function in the parent role or the child role fairly effectively. So if you watch them, they'll relate well to somebody who is beneath them, so to speak. Maybe as a 40-year-old, they can play with the children, which is not bad. I mean, uh, but if that's always where they go, then what they're always thinking about, well, if in here, I can be sort of above this person, okay? And what they're doing is they're switching to this role when they're dealing with a real child or somebody who doesn't know as much as they do. This is gonna get a little complicated here, so you can stay with me. So they'll function very well in the parent role as long as the person they're dealing with is kind of beneath them or has fewer skills or less ability. But if they get to somebody who has more skills or ability, they immediately revert to child. And, and almost never do you see them on, on a peer level. Okay? They're afraid of the peer level. Because the peer level response causes, requires responsibility. It requires ability to give freely and exchange freely, to give and receive love, to give and receive guidance, give and receive direction, and so on. And they're just not very good at this. As long as they can stay here and give orders, okay, or as long as they can stay here and, and put themselves under orders, okay, very hard for them to get up here. All right, we're not ready to leave communication yet. So if you go to doc document 26, uh, communication is transfer of information. 
words, 7%, tone of voice, 38%, body language, 55%. Uh, whoever made those numbers, I have no idea. They're completely arbitrary. But what they do emphasize is that words are a small part of what we're communicating. The attitude and so on. Uh, what about when you're on the phone and nobody can see you? Well, then, of course, there's the tone of voice. What about when you're texting and there's no tone of voice there? That's why they have these little emoticons, right? These little smiley faces and frowny faces, and you know, we make the, you know, all about it. You know more about it than I do. So we do have lots of communication, great deal of communication with ourselves. Most of the communication we have in life is with ourselves. The communication is going on up here in your mind all the time. Most of it is there, okay? Uh, others, we have communication with other people. It's important that we do. And of course, communication with God in our submitting ourselves to Him and praying to Him. Some hints on effective communication. I was teaching this just over the weekend here also to some young married couples. And you know, it's, it's important to you folks, but when you get to where they are, it gets very important. First of all, listen, right? Husbands and wives aren't always very good at listening to each other. And not, some of them would do great with this, but some of them don't. Take the other person seriously. Take the person seriously. When they're talking to you, listen up and get your mind off of other things and listen carefully. Take them seriously. Uh, be sensitive. Care. Look at them. Care about what they're saying. Be really sensitive. Seek to hear before you seek to be heard. Don't try to talk until you've listened. Find out what this person is saying. And provide an unthreatening at atmosphere and environment in your relationship with the people you associate with. Are you providing an unthreatening atmosphere? In other words, can, you, can they speak to you? Or are you always going to hide up here as a parent? And nobody can talk to you without being chopped up. As soon as they talk to you, you go parent to child. Okay. Uh, you may see this in, in people you know. You may see it in families. And you know, this really shuts people down. So make sure, <clears throat> and as I say, I was, I was teaching this to young married families uh, this past weekend, and I tell them, you know, you're busy, you're tired, you have some little children, you've got to provide an unthreatening atmosphere. Whatever time you need to take, take it and do it, and do it well. Don't be possessive. Allow others to say what they have to say. Don't completely control the conversation where you're controlling everything, and you make your statements and you stalk off and don't listen. Okay? That doesn't work. Uh, that, that will work against you. Don't be judgmental. As soon as somebody says something and you start saying, well, don't think like that. You shouldn't think that way. You're crossing a boundary, right? Or, or maybe you kind of get something out of them by saying, oh, you should really listen. I have some more things to tell you. Well, then do, okay? And be careful that we don't cross any kind of boundaries in the process. Don't be prejudicial. In other words, we've decided what the answer is going to be before we even get to the discussion. Uh, next thing is reflect. <clears throat> and as I've said before, think about this really seriously. Reflect what the person has to say. I remember a couple came to, I was at a church and a couple came up to talk with me afterward. And I could see very soon that uh, the wife, these people were married. Uh, he was uh, an official at the church. And I could detect very quickly that his wife was the parent and he was the child. Okay? So they're asking me, you know, what's happening? We're not getting along so well. And what I, I went right to this place on your notes right here, reflect. I said, so when your husband talks to you, I started talking to the wife. We were just there in an open church building after a service. I said, when, you're, when your husband talks to you, what are you doing? I said, what you're doing is... You're thinking about what you're going to say to him before you're listening to what he says. So what do I tell her to do? I say the next time your husband talks to you, and she's one of these sharp ladies. I mean, I couldn't keep up with her, right? Very sharp, just on top of every conversation, every situation, business lady, uh, which is all fine. But if she can't communicate with her husband, things are not going to go well. And so I said, the next time your husband talks to you, I want you to be quiet listen, and then when he's done talking, I want you to reflect back to him what he said before you respond. Okay? When you do that, what, what are you doing? 
We're on the hints of effective communication. Reflect. Repeat the other person's statements in your own words. Don't mimic them, okay? That's not nice. We probably all did that to our siblings. Remember that? They say something and we say their words right back to them. You know, don't do that in adult conversation. <laughs> don't do that if and when you're dating or married, okay? It is really bad news. If you mimic somebody, you turn them off. But take their words and reflect their words back. What you do is say, do I hear you saying that? Okay? An illustration I used on when I was teaching class over the weekend was I said, there was a husband and wife sitting right in front of me. And I said, now suppose, I was talking to the wife, suppose your husband says to you, I'm coming home tonight at 6 o'clock. What do you do? Do you say, okay? Well, that might work, but you could be reflective and you could say back to your husband, say, oh, okay, I'll expect you tonight at 6 o'clock. Very simple thing to do, but what happened? She proved to him that she heard what he said. She also forced him to hear what he said. What if he meant seven? Do we always say exactly what we mean? No. We make mistakes. Now, if she doesn't reflect back and get this ironed out, and he comes home at seven, and she says, you told me you're coming home at six. He says, no, I told you I'm coming home at seven. And it's ten hours later, and who, how are we going to argue? All right? But if she reflects back to him, okay, I'll expect you for supper at 6 o'clock. He now has to think, oh, yes, that is what I said. You know, this all happens in seconds, but it happens. And he said, oh, oh, no, did I say 6? I meant 7. All right? It gives the person an opportunity to process, gives the person an opportunity to correct. And, and that's just a very, very simplistic illustration. But what if it's somebody communicating feelings to you? What if it's somebody communicating concerns or convictions? Okay? And then we go back to them and say, is this what I heard you saying? What I heard you say was that you're not comfortable with something that somebody did. Did I hear what you said correctly? So we are repeating the other person's statements in our own words. We're proving that you heard what they said. <clears throat> it also allows the person to reprocess what they said and make corrections. So suppose somebody comes to you and says, boy, my dad, he's just this terrible tyrant. He's always saying these things and they're nasty, okay? And what do you do? You say, yeah, I heard about your dad. You know, I heard about, and then they come back to you and say, you should hear what he said last night. Oh, tell me more, okay? You see where we're going here? Where does this stop? It doesn't, it doesn't work. This gets us, after a while, we're 60 miles away in our minds, and, and we've accomplished nothing. So if somebody comes and says, well, my mother is this person who's just unkind to me all the time, get reflective. <coughs> okay, say, mm. well, I'm sorry to hear that. Well, just, just what is it about your mother that's causing problems, okay? Or what is it about your sister that's becoming the issue? You see what we're doing? We're, we're being reflective. We're trying to, and then he say, Oh, well, maybe she's not as bad as I made it sound, okay? Sometimes when we get reflective, they correct. And they back up a little bit because maybe they were just really upset. Maybe they were just right off of an argument. And so when we get reflective, we're proving that we heard, we're proving that we care, we're also asking them to rethink what they said. And they can then adjust and make corrections, okay? So be really, really careful. Maybe you have questions about that. This is very, very important. I've had people come and tell me that this concept alone has changed their lives. Just the concept of being reflective instead of escalating every conversation. You can escalate every conversation. And after a while, we have no idea where we are. But if you can reflect with your parents, with your siblings, with your friends, with your teachers, with everybody, if you can reflect, it gives them an opportunity to correct. It also proves that we're on a path that's going to take us somewhere, not on a path that's going to take us where we have no idea where we are.